What is up, y'all? My name is Kristen. My name is Sarah. And welcome to the Red Brum and Red Wine Podcast. Together! <laughs> I guess we're always together but I know if you're looking at the YouTube video it's a little different right now we're actually like we can touch each other again it's such a nice feeling mm-hmm. yeah guys welcome uh it feels awkward because like more than five people are listening now but <laughs> hey it is Sarah's turn <clears throat> for her case and I know nothing about what you're talking about ah okay so last week I went camping in Colorado with some friends. Um, We went to the Red Rocks for a Glass Animals concert. And so we went camping in Estes Park and the Rocky Mountains. And you know me, when I go somewhere, I'm like, I'm gonna see what's happening around here, true crime wise. Learn some history, Mm -hmm. her story. And so I did that and I found something interesting to talk about. Um, from the Denver, Colorado area. Ooh. Yeah. So today I will be talking about the real-life Spider-Man of Denver, Colorado. There's a a real-life one? And the murder of Philip Peters. Um, Oh, shit. Okay. Right. So I'm not going to be talking about, like, a fun guy in a suit who whips around the city, like, saving people. It's quite the opposite. Oh, shit. (laughs) The real life Spider Man, aka. <laughs> I'm just thinking it's like a. You're about to tell me if it's not a guy in a suit, so like radioactive spider bite. <laughs> <laughs> you will find out why, but not until later. Okay. So okay. I'll keep guessing. If, yeah. If you have any guesses as to why throughout, please throw them at me because I'm sure it'll be um, funny. Mm-hmm. Maybe. The real-life Spider-Man of Denver, a.k.a. Theodore Edward Conies, mm-hmm. born in Illinois. Oh, <laughs> fuck you. Okay, yeah, it's Illinois. Sorry, I for sure learned how to say that right this time. He was born in Illinois in 1882. Mm-hmm. So at the time of this kind of, when we get to the present, he's about 58, 59. Oh. He and his family moved to Denver in the 1910s, didn't get an exact date, but it was when he was like 17, I think. Mm -hmm. Theodore had poor health as a child. He was frail and he didn't really get to play outside with other kids. So he spent his time inside playing the mandolin. Doctors actually told Theodore that he wouldn't live past the age of 18, but uh, yeah, so at 17, he and his family moved to Colorado, and maybe that mountain air did him some good because he would live on past the age of 18. Well, I mean, I, I literally have no idea what he had, but I know with tuberculosis, uh, they would always say, like, go up into the mountains, get some right. fresh air, and it actually worked for some people. So, right. I mean. Um, yeah, and I don't know what exactly he had either, just you that know. he was sickly and frail, so who knows, but... Theodore would join a mandolin club where he would meet fellow mandolinist or musician. Mandolin's like a guitar, right? Um, it's like a banjo type okay, okay. thing. But it's like uh, you hold you yes. play it. Okay, yeah. Strings. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is where he would meet fellow musician Philip Peters. And his wife, Helen, by the way. Sorry. Oh. Um, Sorry, Helen. By the way. (laughs) Sorry. No, Helen is very important. Oh, shit. Yeah. After Theodore's mother would pass away from illness, Philip and Helen would invite Theodore over for dinners pretty often at their home. So they became, like, really nice elder elder friends, I guess. I don't... They weren't um, too much older, but they were older. Mm Mm-hmm. Like I said, Theodore did end up living beyond past doctor's expectations, um, but his kind of, like, sickliness would follow him into adulthood. Mm -hmm. As he got older, because of his kind of illness or sickliness, along with the eventual Great Depression, he would not be able to ever hold a job for very long. Mm -hmm. 
So he began to, like, he became a drifter. <laughs> he began to drift across the United States or the country in 1917, and he wouldn't find himself back in Denver until 1941. Damn. Yeah, so let me get my math right here. He spent about 24 years being a drifter. Man, it, like, not that it was a great time to be alive back then, but, like, as a drifter, way easier to be a drifter back then. Oh, than, yeah. Like, way safer, way easier. Um, and sorry, I also meant to mention that because he wouldn't ever be able to keep a job long and being a drifter often meant he was homeless. So yeah. homeless as well. When he returns to Denver, he would find himself sleeping on doorsteps, alleyways. And in September of 1941, with a harsh winter coming, Theodore decides to go to an old friend's house to ask for help. Oh. You know, like with food, shelter, money, literally probably anything. When Theodore arrives to 73-year-old Philip Peter's house, who he had met about 30 years previous when Theodore was just 17 years old, he sees that no one is home. Philip was actually at the hospital vi visiting Helen, who was there due to a hip replacement she had had. And she had been there a few weeks or so. And so instead of Theodore leaving, you know, or just waiting for someone to come home, he just enters the home through the unlocked front door. Uh, people didn't lock their doors back then, okay. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was that time period. Oh, God. Where... What a time I, I'm to... sure it had locks, yeah. No, but... People never locked their yeah. doors back then. It took till, like, not even the 70s. Like, I'd say 80s, maybe even. It took until this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he enters the home and just kind of helps himself starts rummaging around for food or whatever he could find when philip arrives home he doesn't seem to notice that anyone had been in his home um he goes on about his life and he visited helen in the hospital every single day she was in there yeah. and it seemed like she was in there for a while because she was older and back then, you know, not modern medicine, I'm sure you spent, you had a longer recovery time. Such a friendly neighborhood. Helen and Philip's neighbors were aware that Helen was in the hospital and they all wanted to help out as much as they could with Philip and wanted to like ease the burden. So they always invited him over for dinner every night. Like he would go to like a different neighbor's house or um, pretty often he'd go to the same neighbor's house who I'll mention in a minute. But on the night of October 17th, 1941, after Philip did not show up for dinner at his neighbor Jenny Ross's house, she went over to check on him. And Jenny Ross is a neighbor that Philip would frequent her house for dinner. So she would be expecting him and it was odd that he wouldn't show up without any kind of word or notice. Jenny knocked on Philip's front door and got no response, but she immediately grew concerned when she saw Philip's hat and cane in the doorway, like through the window, I guess. Mm -hmm. Jenny yelled to another neighbor, Doris Burke, who climbed over the screened-in back porch and was able to unlock the door. So I'm not really sure what kind of porch scenario that is, but... But um, wasn't the door already... Or it was a different door, I guess? They didn't try the That day, one. the door was locked. Oh. And we'll touch on that. Okay. And while I'm mentioning the house a little bit, I do have a picture of it. Oh, okay. So, obviously, we can't see the backyard, but it's yeah. a small house, and there's close neighbors. Yeah. When Jenny entered the home, she turned on the kitchen light, which revealed a huge puddle of blood on the floor. In the adjacent room... Philip in Helen's bedroom, Jenny found Philip Peters deceased. Police arrived within minutes and noticed that the crime scene did seem pretty fresh. They also noticed that the crime scene spread throughout multiple uh, rooms in the home as well. Like I said, there was blood in the kitchen area, Philip's body was in the bedroom, but there is disarray elsewhere as well. Mm. It was very apparent that a struggle had taken place. 
There were no signs of valuables or money missing, so a robbery didn't really seem likely. There was one strange detail, though, Kristen. All of the doors were locked from the inside, and there was no sign of a forced or any kind of entry or exit. Philip's walking stick, or cane, which was broken in half, the butt of a pistol, and a stove shaker were all near his body. And if you don't know what I mean by stove shaker, it's like this big heavy iron iron (laughs) grate thing for a stove it's to like shake the old school stove like i think the charcoal yeah like coal the coals yeah i don't know Um, yeah yeah. Hmm. so it's like something kind of heavy okay thank you i actually was not even thinking of what that could look like you're welcome i had to look it up just to double check so i should google most of these items all someone used to bludgeon philip with at least 30 times that is overkill okay the defense wounds on philip's arms showed that he fought for his life and just confirmed that there was a really big struggle that happened one of his fingernails was completely like torn off and gone anyone that knew philip Like, just could not think of anyone who had a reason to do this. They couldn't imagine any possible reason. Sadly, investigators didn't have any leads and were pretty freaking stumped. We are in the 40s, so we don't have a lot of investigation technology, DNA stuff isn't isn't around yet it's from uh what i gathered when i did that um the arson case in texas i'm so sorry the name is slipping me but from what i gathered detectives back in the day it was really more like a word of mouth on the training techniques and it was like that detective or that sheriff that was in that town was the one that taught you and so whatever techniques or whatever tricks and sleep up their sleep that they had that was what yeah was and so passed it could down be to different them. too yeah um, every place was different it was all there was no book you know yeah and remember we are in illinois Denver. oh damn it <laughs> i just really wanted to make sure that it was it known right? that i yeah, yeah. I, I know how to she say it now she can say it we're in right. denver now colorado Yes, but it's not the Denver as we know it today. It's like the Rocky Mountains in the 40s. And so just imagine what their, like, detective investigations teams looks like. They had one. I mean, they, I'm sure they were, like, good people. Yeah. But I don't know what kind of techniques they used. It didn't seem like they had a lot to go off of, to be fair. Mm. So... No one was able to give any kind of description or information, you know, on seeing anyone out of the ordinary. No one saw anyone or anything suspicious in the neighborhood that day. No tips came in whatsoever. Because of the perplexities involved with Philip's murder, no one seeing anything, the doors and windows being locked from the inside, it being kind of very actual brutal <laughs> sorry i'm like kind of brutal no it was actually very brutal Fucking overkill if you ask like, me poor old man and yeah he obviously had people that were like inviting him over every night he was very well known within the community see i'm not nice enough to be friends with my neighbor so yeah it, they'd be like yeah i wouldn't be surprised your body was in there rotting for four months before we knew about it <laughs> I didn't have a son no one would (laughs) (laughs) it takes someone a long time to find me if my husband wasn't around that's Mm -hmm. for sure the crime scene was dubbed Denver ghost house slang by media because they like no one didn't find no one knew who did it they had no leads and because poor Helen was in the hospital during all of this. I forgot about Helen. 
She remained in the hospital until February 1942. So when she got discharged, she came home to an empty house where her husband was brutally murdered. Mm. Unfortunately, she injured her hip again and went back to the hospital. But then she returned home again um, just a few months later in April of 1942 as I said, being older and at this point mostly bedridden, she couldn't do a lot around the house, so she decided to hire a housekeeper or two, but very few would, or any at all, would take the job and end up keeping it for very long. Because of the fucking ghost house thing? That's messed up. It, she needs help. I know, but these women got freaked out, so... One of the women fled the house in terror, (laughs) saying that she couldn't live in a haunted house or stay in a haunted house. Was she experiencing anything? She believed there to be invisible forces within the home. What? Okay, did she give examples of these invisible forces? Another woman did. Okay. This woman who resigned because she saw a pale bony hand sliding around an open door and when she went to like (gasps) look for it she just heard footsteps kind of receding away and nothing was there (laughs) why do you pick these stories i don't like that i would actually like die No. Like, Sarah, what are you doing behind that door? Get out. Like, <laughs> Just I, me. I need less for arson. <laughs> I need less. I, I would go to jail. <laughs> I'm going to cheers to drink, uh, making Kristen cry. <laughs> I didn't no, mean Cheers to drinking, yeah. I didn't mean to, but fuck, that like really scared me. Because <laughs> I, I have a feeling that I know how this dude gets his Spider-Man name and I don't like it. Oh my god. A ghost seemed like the only reasonable explanation for the mysterious creaks, weird lights going on and off, and shadowy figures in the Peter's house on West Moncrief Place. No, no it doesn't. That is not the only reasonable explanation. (laughs) Unable to keep any kind of help, and with a growing reputation of her house being haunted, Helen moved in with her and Philip's son and his wife, who lived in Grand Junction, Colorado, who, which is not that far. Helen and Philip's home would remain vacant, but strange things kept happening. Reports of what became known as the Moncrief Ghost didn't stop and quickly fueled its paranormal reputation. After all, it was the home of a brutal unsolved murder. I'm like, I'm so fucking glad for Texas that, like, we have these thin-ass walls. No one, (laughs) no one is living in between the dry sheet and the fucking pink shit. I know, back then, and they probably build them thick to make them warm, you know? (gasps) Some people, while walking through the neighborhood down the street, would not even walk past the Peters' home. I wouldn't either. Yeah. I don't blame them. Philip's murder investigation would unfortunately go cold, but police would continue to do routine checks of inside Helen and Phillips' home, along with patrolling outside along with the neighborhood, due to several reports of strange things happening there. Oh, I was about to say, good for them for just, like, doing that. Being nice, right? <laughs> well, they knew it was supposed to be vacant. They knew of Helen's situation. Mm-hmm. They knew it was supposed to be vacant. But they got... I don't know how many strange reports, but it was enough to make them patrol it regularly a little. So wait, when Helen left, did she sell it or it's just... No. It was just... They just, I guess, kept it in the name. It remained vacant hmm. sitting there. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what their plans were for it. Yeah. So. They were waiting for Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> Lights would turn on and off and noises coming from the house, such as footsteps or the position of the blinds changing and even curtains moving would be in these reports. There was an instance where police got enough strange reports in a small amount of time, like maybe a day or something, that a few officers went and sat outside the home for two days and two nights, 
but nothing happened. Damn. I yeah. hope they did that in shifts. That sucks. I think it was Obviously, too, like, but... yeah, yeah. So they, mm. yeah. Until July 30th, 1942, detectives Roy Bloxham and William Jackson were in the neighborhood when they decided to go check in on the Peters' home. They noticed a curtain move in one of the windows of the house, and knowing that no one was supposed to be there, like, they knew it had to be, like, that wasn't a ghost, yeah. unless it was, but knowing it, it was supposed to be vacant, they drew their guns and charged at the front door. Um, I, I believe they, I don't think they broke down the front door, um, seeing as how they did routine and checks of inside the home. I don't know if they had a copy of the key on them. Maybe they did have to break down the, the door, but either way, they made their way inside the home. They kind of like made their way through the home, but quickly made their way to a closet where they heard a noise and it sounded like the noise of a lock turning. In the closet, they saw a skinny leg disappearing <gasps> up a small hole Stop. with <laughs> crawl space okay. in the ceiling of the closet. Okay. One of the officers or detectives moved quickly enough to grab the leg really hard and <laughs> pull down what appeared to be the Moncrief ghost. Who was a really scrawny, pale, smelly man. (laughs) He was dressed in rags that were held together by, like, strings. The man was described as Denver Police Chief James Childers as, quote, the strangest looking human I had ever seen. He was a tall man, just under six feet but thin as a wilted weed. His dirty hair hung low over his ears, and his skin was the ugly, unwashed gray of an overcast sky. Mm. He was very thin due to malnutrition. The ambulance doctor who examined this man said that it was the worst case of malnutrition he had ever seen. The man was around six feet... (laughs) Six feet tall, just under, and weighed about 75 pounds. <gasps> Holy shnikes. That's like... I like That's how much Bush weighs. How is that even possible? I like was expecting something over 100. That and to, for it to be almost 30 pounds under my guess. Wow. Wow. How did... Yeah. Okay, the doctor was not exaggerating. That's insane. Because, like... I'm like, how did he my survive, dog honestly? is around that weight. Jeez. Please. Well, I'll tell you how he survived. Or more like how he lived, which is how he survived, I guess, if you put it like that. This um. is where we go to the attic. It's always that. The cramped attic, may I add, picture. See that little head? That's the entire thing? (gasps) Oh my god, I didn't even see the head. Denver police sent their smallest officer up into the crawl space, which led to a cramped attic area where Coney's had been residing. You have, like... Or I should say nesting, really. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, like, crying because I can't imagine (laughs) living... I can't imagine living in that. You have to be laying down. Mm, Let me blow your mind just a little bit more. He's six feet tall and he lived in that? The attic entrance was just about barely eight inches wide (gasps) by 15 inches long. The actual attic was 27 inches high, like a little more than two feet, and 57 inches wide. So in the picture where the officer is sticking it up his head, that's the entrance. I'm crying. And I think they placed the camera there for... 
You couldn't pay me. You had to be 75 pounds to fit through there. You couldn't pay me. Well, maybe I could. You have to like I used to crawl through doggy doors when I was locked out of the house. This really has me fucked up. And I will come back to this picture. Okay, so no wonder, because I, no one, I, that is the last thought that my brain would have someone would be living up there. Because impossible, I would think. No, no, my worst fear, new fear unlocked, because that is not right. That's not right at all. How, and he, oh, oh my god. In the attic space was a bed that had been fashioned out of filthy blankets, an ironing board, stacks of newspapers, some were as old as 20 years. I don't know if that's significant, but it's kind of creepy. Yeah, I hope it's not significant. There were other items crammed into this small attic space, such as a light bulb, a single light bulb hanging, which you'll see in the photo, empty bottles, cans of tomatoes, and a radio. This man had collected his waste, which was lined along the attic walls in cans. So I will... You do not have a photo. It's all the stuff. And he had also not bathed. During his entire, what is it, nine-month residency. The stench from the attic was so overwhelming that the officer that had gone up there vomited. And um, so, after being examined by paramedics, this man from the attic, and also after giving, you know, some food and a bath... (laughs) Poor people that had to give this man a bath. He probably, like, didn't even remember. I don't know. After receiving this treatment, the man would reveal his identity, which was Theodore Edward Coney's, 59 years old. He also shared his story and confession along with his identity, and... This is a confession for the murder of Philip Peters. Theodore shared how when he entered the Peters' home back in September of 1941, he never left. He told detectives, quote, I thought this attic would become my shelter. I would sneak out at night and get bits of food from the icebox and they wouldn't even know I was there. So every night, he'd wait until he heard Philip snoring And he would sneak down from the attic. Basically, he also had free range of the house every day when Philip went to visit Helen at the hospital. So he would sneak out of the attic to, again, get food, but also use the bathroom. I was about to say, that's how I assumed he used the bathroom. So that's why I think the cans messed me up a little bit. Yeah. Well, Um, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Yeah, and I guess, like, they're in the house most of the time at night, so... Theodore's plan to reside in the Peters' attic was working fine for him until one night, Philip woke up to find a skinny and ragged man whom he did not recognize raiding his icebox. That's what they called refrigerators back then. Theodore said, quote, Peters didn't recognize me. I guess I've changed a lot in 30 years. And you're, like, uninvited in his house, maybe, too. I mean, uh, did you even, like, uh, it doesn't even matter, because, oh, my God. After being caught in the act, Philip hit Theodore with his cane. Then Theodore grabbed an old revolver hanging from the wall nearby and hit Philip Peters on the head. Theodore stated, quote, he said he was going to call the police. So I followed him and hit him again. He then grabbed an iron stove shaker and continued attacking poor Philip. He said, quote, I just kept hitting him until he didn't move anymore. After brutally attacking and murdering Philip, Theodore grabbed him some food 
and retreated back up into the attic. Theodore stayed in the attic through the winter and somehow didn't freeze in the unheated house. Mm. He lived off of canned food, preserves, and cornmeal. And all of this he found throughout the house. He, like, would rummage the basement where he found things, obviously along with the kitchen. Uh, For water, he would gather melted snow from the roof because... I guess he, like, didn't want to go downstairs. I don't know what the water system was like there, if they had a well or, like, how that worked. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, he gathered snow from the roof for water. Theodore would describe his nine-month-long residency in the attic as a, quote, hellish, terrible nightmare. According to the police who had initially investigated Philip's murder, they said They didn't initially search that attic crawl space because simply the entrance to it was so small, they couldn't possibly imagine anyone going up there, anything being up there besides small storage items. So, again, 8 inches by 15 inches. Pretty small, so I don't know. The officer that went into the crawl space... The one that I mentioned also vomited because of the stench. Fred Zarno said of the attic, quote, a man would have to be a spider to stand it long up there, end quote. How we got the name. The newspapers and media heard this quote from Officer Zarno and ran with it, Mm -hmm. dubbing Theodore Coney's as the Denver Spider-Man, as well as the Moncrief Ghost. Theodore Conies was charged and convicted of the murder of Philip Peters by jury trial and was sentenced to life in prison in October of 1942. Things happened quicker back then. We'll say that. Yeah. Life in, (laughs) Kristen, life in prison turned out to be very comfortable for Theodore. I was going to say, there's no way that like that fucking crawl space. Sorry, we have a dog. There's no <laughs> way puppies that, here. There's no way that that crawl space is fucking comfier than a prison cell. I would rather go to prison. Compared to living on the streets or in an attic, Theodore was living the high life. Comfortable. You get he, meals. He what? He had shelter, a bed, food, a toilet, he a could, roommate. Probably, I don't know. He could lift his arms up and not <laughs> yeah, fucking he, he hit didn't the have ceiling. To, like, crouch down. What the fuck? Six foot. Jesus. Yeah. So he did carry out his life sentence until his death on May 16th, 1967, at the age of 84. Damn. Yeah. In closing, I'll just touch a little bit on Philip Peters. He was 73 years old when he was brutally murdered Mm. by Theodore Coney's. He was kind and well-respected. He worked for the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad for 40 years before retiring he played the mandolin for many years. Again, he met Theodore Coney through the Mandolin Club. Or the Denver Guitar Club, I'm sorry. I think they just did string stuff. So mm-hmm. so he was a member of the Denver Guitar Club as well. He left behind his wife, Helen, and son. And so, uh, just rest in peace, Philip. And just maybe check your crawl spaces. And, like, the places you don't even think about. The tiny ones. <laughs> it's so unfortunate because Philip didn't deserve that. He, because he had, obviously, a much comfortable life in prison. So what was the point of that? You just put yourself through years of torture and killed someone for nothing. Like, ugh. And then he lives longer than Philip. That's what really gets me. Yeah. How crazy is that? For all of that time, he, like, was malnutritioned and... seventy five five pounds like you're not happy back, I guess. you're not happy i don't like so i mean it makes me happy i guess that he at least made himself go through that but at the same time so pointless like just go to jail don't like kill the nice yeah. old man that is in the end just gonna give you a better home than the fucking crawl space you're trying to live in right Ugh. anyways sorry we have a whiny dog so i guess this is Right? This is the end? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, she's done. Okay. Well, until next time, guys, check your crawl spaces, stay hydrated, drink some water, stay safe, see something, say something, and yeah, like, comment, review, subscribe if you want. It helps us out a lot. She agrees. At I... Uh, yep. <laughs> At R-A-R-W podcast. And send us an email if you have a certain topic you want to listen to or if you just want to say hi. Especially <laughs> to that one. Like, we're sorry. We're crying. Red rum and red wine podcast at gmail.com. And no, we like we literally let her out. We took a break in the middle of this where she's just being feisty. Okay. It's uh, bedtime. It's bedtime. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good night or a good morning wherever you are. Arriva Dirce. Is that, <laughs> is that it? Is that one? Buenos noches. Buenos noches. What is this? Happy siesta.